I would like to begin by acknowledging that I am presenting from the historic and contemporary lands of the Duwamish, Snoqualmie, and Muckleshoot nations and other Coast Salish peoples who call the waters and coastline of the Salish Sea home. During the evening of January 30th, 1855, six Macaw chiefs boarded the schooner Potter to meet with Isaac Stevens, the newly appointed governor of Washington Territory. The Potter had brought the governor's treaty commission to Nia Bay to negotiate with the five Macaw villages clustered at Cape Flattery, the most northwestern point of the contiguous United States. After Governor Stevens outlined the principal features of the proposed treaty, the chiefs each spoke in turn, articulating their rights to the marine waters over which they held authority. Speaking first, Kulchut, one of two chiefs representing the Nia Bay village, explained that I ought to have the right to fish and take whales and get food when I like. I am afraid that if I cannot take halibut where I want, I will become poor. The others echoed his words, informing the governor about macaw rights to hunt whales and seals and to fish for salmon and halibut in ancestral waters over which they had held authority for generations. Governor Stevens acknowledged these rights, stating that he wanted them to fish, but that the whites should fish also. Kalchut agreed to live as a friend to the whites and they should fish together. In the 1855 Treaty of Nia Bay, the official document that the U.S. Senate ratified, the Macaw chiefs fishing together became to fish in common with whites, thereby creating what I call a settler commons. Most scholars acknowledge that the acquisition of native land drives settler colonialism. To this end, non-natives and settler colonial governments have sought to eliminate indigenous polities so as to people native homelands with whites. Genocidal at times, settler violence against indigenous peoples sought to exterminate natives bodily, while assimilation policies, such as boarding schools and allotment, sought to eradicate indigenous identities, cultures, and autonomy. As Patrick Wolfe explains, settler society required the practical elimination of the natives in order to establish itself on their territory. Put simply, the goal of settler colonialism was and continues to be the acquisition and control of native lands. Yet the settler colonial logic of elimination did not just unfold on land, it also unfolded across indigenous marine spaces. The traditional assumption of settler colonialism grounds it in the actions of settlers who improved land through cultivation, farms, and town building, all of which required the elimination of natives. The Macaw example demonstrates how this process also happened at sea and reveals that settlement also reconfigured spaces and spatial relationships via property concepts, including the creation of commons. In this presentation, I argue that the logic of elimination shaped the Treaty of Nia Bay and established a marine settler commons that privileged non-native users and sought to remove indigenous peoples from the water, despite Governor Stevens's assurances that he wanted macaws to fish. Thus, the settler commons follows the logic of elimination, although it might not seem, although it might seem otherwise, at first. Most narratives about settler colonialism explain how nation states replaced nebulous indigenous homelands, assumed to be held communally with individually owned fee simple property. But the Macaw's experience with settler colonialism shows the reverse. The United States replaced propertied indigenous marine spaces to which chiefs limited access to others with a settler commons premised on equal access in which theoretically anyone, Indians and whites, could fish. Within two generations of signing the Treaty of Nia Bay, however, open and equal access to these fisheries fell victim to technological advances in the industry and state laws that privileged settlers over natives. This marine-oriented example encourages us to consider a wider scope for the contexts, effects, and goals of settler colonialism. Similar to territorial spaces, 
marine waters were the targets of settler colonial projects, and their conquest also followed the logic of elimination. The legal sleight of hand that created the marine settler commons began with a misalignment of language, specifically Colchute's fishing together statement and the ratified treaties to fish in common with wording did not mean the same thing. The challenges of translating words and concepts across two worldviews account for some of the disconnect. The treaty negotiators relied on a chain of translation to convey the treaty terms between the chiefs and the white commissioners. Stevens's words were first translated by Captain Fowler of the Potter from English into Chinook jargon, a local trade language. Captain Jack, a neighboring Sklalem chief, then translated from Chinook jargon into Macaw. The process was then reversed for conveying Macaw statements. As others have noted, Chinook jargon, consisting of approximately 500 words at that time, was entirely unsuited for conveying the complex treaty terms discussed, a fact that Stevens appeared to know but ignored. Words often have deeper and broader meanings embedded within specific cultural and historical contexts. Stevens's ignorance of the new territories indigenous peoples made it difficult for him to understand the full meaning of what Kilchut and the other Macaw chiefs said. Calling themselves the Quidditchaat, which means the people of the Cape, Macaws have fashioned their identity around the sea. For generations, fishing for halibut and salmon and hunting seals and whales made Macaws a wealthy and powerful people. For instance, by 1852, the people of the Cape were annually selling more than 30,000 gallons of whale oil, valued at more than $20,000 back then, to non-native traders and keeping a similar amount for trade with neighboring indigenous communities and personal consumption. Macaw whale oil and other marine products were important commodities in the nascent economy of the new U.S. Territory of Washington. Governor Stevens recognized this during the treaty negotiations when he acknowledged what whalers the macaws were and promised to send them equipment to support their whaling and fishing industries. So he did appear to understand the overall importance of the sea to the people of the Cape. But the governor did not grasp macaw ownership of specific marine spaces. Indeed, Stevens's ignorance, willful or not, reflected and shaped a key component of the, settler, uh, of the settler commons, the colonial state's presumption of the absence of local institutions. Similar to other Northwest Coast peoples and to many other indigenous peoples who faced settler colonialism, the Macaws recognized complex ownership rights over many items. Called two pots, Property included spatial and intangible items such as names, songs, histories, whales, beaches, and most relevant for this presentation, marine fishing banks for halibut and other species. In the mid-19th century, the people of the Cape still observed a three-tiered social stratification which included chiefs, commoners, and slaves, and one social status determined the type of property rights he or she could enjoy. As property themselves, slaves rarely owned anything. Commoners owned personal items, such as canoes, clothing, and fishing gear, although they usually did not own culturally significant property items, such as resource areas or titled names, commoners did have usufruct rights to the hunting and fishing grounds that belonged to higher-ranking peoples. This system of property and usufruct rights, embedded within the Northwest Coast social structure, composed the local institutions that governed Macaw Marine space. Macaw chiefs, such as the six individuals Stevens met on the first day of the treaty negotiations, held all the significant types of property. Kolchut, Kichuk, Tsukawatl spoke specifically about outside resources like whales, halibut, seals, and even the salt water itself. These were called outside resources because they were in marine waters outside bays, inlets, and rivers. <laughs>
The right to hunt whales belonged to the highest ranking chiefs because they possessed power and authority that whales would respect. From the kin-centric ecological perspective of Northwest Coast society, whales were people and members of the extended community. When a macaw pursued his prey on the ocean, the whale gave itself only to one who was ritually and physically prepared to receive the tons of meat, bone, and blubber that could be rendered into oil. When a dead whale drifted ashore on a particular chief's beach, the people of the Cape similarly perceived this as a gift belonging to that authority figure. High-ranking chiefs also owned and managed halibut banks located underwater on the continental shelf up to 60 or more miles offshore. In oral testimony collected in 1941, Macaw elders provided many historical examples of family-owned fisheries within these banks and at other locations. They explained that they would not fish someone else's grounds without permission. From these property fishing banks, the people of the Cape harvested and preserved substantial quantities of halibut. For instance, in 1880, Macaws, then a community of 728 individuals, took over 1.5 million pounds of halibut. At the time of the treaty in 1855, fishing returns would have at least been comparable. So from Colchute's perspective, through the treaty, he was extending important fishing rights to white citizens of the new territory, just as he and other Macaw authorities sometimes did on a limited case-by-case -case basis to other Macaws. The people of the Cape saw outside resources as the most important property items because they provided a wealth of goods that allowed these leaders to feed their people and trade for other items from neighboring villages and non-native ships and trading posts. Although one's high status was initially inherited, chiefs maintained their position and confirmed their ownership rights by caring for their people and by throwing feasts, which scholars often called potlatches. Neighboring Sklalums recognized the renown of the people of the Cape to host lengthy and lavish events by calling them macaws, a name that means generous with food. The abundance that the Quidditchaat wrested from the marine waters off Cape Flattery made them a wealthy and influential people in the region. During the treaty negotiations, when Colchute told Stevens that I do not want you to leave me destitute, he was invoking not just poverty, but the need to retain Macaw marine property through specific indigenous institutions. This would preserve the people of the Cape's identity, economic autonomy, and regional reputation. Although Governor Stevens appeared to understand the importance of Macaw maritime industry, he was likely unwilling and unable to make sense of, much less acknowledge, the chief's statements about marine property and its proper management through indigenous institutions. Differing concepts of marine space made it even more difficult to align Kulchut's words with the final treaty language. For instance, Stevens and the Treaty Commission did not see marine waters as propertied spaces. Instead, they saw them as a commons for American Indian subjects and non-native U.S. citizens to share. In transforming property macaw waters into a marine settler commons, Stevens initiated the typical settler colonial elimination of indigenous sovereignty, but this time at sea. Like other forms of property, history frames and defines the commons in particular ways at specific times and places. A number of historical factors shaped Governor Stevens's version of a marine settler commons. His experiences before being appointed governor of Washington Territory likely meant that he saw nearshore waters, such as those that Macaws owned, as under the sovereign control of the nation state. From 1839 to 1846, he worked for the Army Corps of Engineers, building coastal fortifications in New England. In 1849, he was assigned to the U.S. Coast Survey for a three-year survey of the Pacific coastline from California north. At the time of these two assignments, most nation states, including the United States, claimed a three-mile zone offshore as sovereign territorial seas in which they could exercise authority and regulate use, such as by excluding foreign fishers. In 
Stevens's work in the 1840s was part of this process of enforcing U.S. sovereignty over the territorial sea. In the antebellum era, U.S. officials had still not begun to regulate fisheries within the territorial seas. Instead, officials and fishers treated the nation-state's waters as a homogenized commons to which U.S. subjects had an equal right of open access. Fisheries and waters beyond the three-mile limit of the territorial sea were also treated as a commons, except they were open to users from all nations. Legal property concepts of the time shaped and reflected this notion of open access to fisheries of these marine commons. According to Joseph Engels' 1824 treatise on the common law in relation to water courses, the sea was considered as open and common to all. Influenced by these historical and legal contexts, Stevens likely conceived of the sea this way. Not only did he once aspire to practice law, but he also had purchased this particular treatise for the New Territories Library. None of this boded well for once property macaw fishing banks. Those in territorial waters were reconfigured as a marine commons open to settlers, whereas those beyond the three-mile limit, including the macaw's most productive halibut banks, were thrown open to all. By transforming the propertied indigenous waters into a settler commons of open access, Stevens sought to foster white citizens' participation in the harvest of one of the new territory's most important natural resources, fish. In his first inaugural address to the territory's legislative assembly, he highlighted the area's fisheries, along with its minerals and forests, as one of several important resources for the development of Washington. Property indeed existed in the open access marine commons. Fishers simply had to take it first. This is what legal scholars identify as res nullius, resources that no one owns until captured. Replacing native property and the indigenous institutions governing it with a space of res nullius was a key step in Stevens's creation of this particular settler commons. At the time that Stevens was creating the marine settler commons through his negotiations with the people of the Cape, fishers elsewhere were contesting the practice of an equal and open access commons. Early 19th century conflicts between the United States and Great Britain over the Newfoundland cod fishery shaped the subsequent contours of the marine settler commons in the Pacific Northwest, eventually making access to be anything but open and equal. As the North Atlantic cod fishery experienced noticeable depletion in the second quarter of the 19th century, local settler fishers of the Newfoundland colony blamed foreigners and emerging capitalists who could afford to place new, more expensive seine nets on the fishing banks. These protesters desired to preserve a customary and equitable right of access to fish for all, not just for elites. Similarly, settler fishing communities from Cape Cod to Cape Breton in Nova Scotia began experiencing decay and diminution in overfished offshore banks, which they also blamed on new types of gear that took fish indiscriminately. The mid-19th century protests of local settler fishers in the North Atlantic took on increasingly racist tones, which shaped what Stevens's marine settler commons in Washington Territory would become, a space for settlers for white fishers. In his 1853 examination of the Atlantic fisheries, with a special emphasis on the contentious Newfoundland cod fishery, Lorenzo Sabine, a special investigator for the U.S. Department of the Treasury, concluded that there are fish enough in the American seas for all who speak the Saxon tongue, for all of the Saxon stock. Although at the time Sabine framed Saxon solidarity in opposition to French and Portuguese fishers, who were clearly not of Saxon stock, the stark line he drew in the North Atlantic would get exported to the fisheries of the greater Puget Sound region later in the century. As an active settler colonial official, Stevens's sense of a racial hierarchy echoed Sabine's sentiments about the primacy of superior Saxon stock. 
In every one of the treaties the, gover the governor negotiated with Washington's tribal nations in 1854 and 1855, he invoked the all-powerful Great Father who would paternalistically watch over the Indians. Similarly, he compared the industry, development, and progress of whites to what his son Hazard later referred to as the feebleness and uncertain future of the territory's natives. When Stevens negotiated the treaties with tribal nations such as the Macaw, the only competitors to white fishers, a group of people who would grow exponentially in number, were natives, whose numbers would plummet from increased exposure to the diseases of whites. The governor pointed to this impending collapse of the territory's native populations during many treaty negotiations. His son echoed this era's assumption of a demographic collapse in his hagiography of his father. So in securing the right of whites to fish in common with natives, Isaac Stevens expected that the actual sharing of the resource would only last for a short period, and that it would be overseen by the Great Father, not native authorities. Over time, the supposedly equal and open access of the settler commons, already being framed in racialized terms, would become a de facto fishery for whites. But it took another two generations for the near elimination of native fishers from the marine settler commons that Stevens created. Unlike the mid-19th century Newfoundland cod fishery, the waters off Cape Flattery and in Puget Sound still teemed with fish, so regulations tied to one's race were unnecessary at the time. Indeed, any type of fishing regulation still seemed anathema then because nearly everyone assumed that oceanic fisheries were inexhaustible. Industrial salmon fishing, driven by the explosive growth of canneries, did not hit Puget Sound waters until the 1890s, thereby demonstrating that marine fisheries could be quickly overfished. As their property waters became filled with non-native fishers, Macaws experienced a settler colonial outcome similar to that endured by other tribal nations. Using expensive traps and increasingly larger mechanized vessels, ballooning numbers of whites with access to capital garnered sizable shares of marine fisheries and shut out indigenous fishers. As Washington's waters became overfished in the early 20th century, white fishers blamed Indians. This was grossly inaccurate because in 1900, indigenous fishers only composed 12% of the state's commercial fishing industry. Despite this fact, settler commercial and sport fishers used their better access to state power to legislate natives out of the marine settler commons. Washington state fishing regulations targeted native gear, particularly fixed gear, such as nets and weirs that stretched across waterways. The state also required licenses for commercial fishing by 1909, but these were not, but these were only available to U.S. citizens. Most Washington Indians at this time were ineligible for these licenses because they were barred from, citizen, from citizenship until 1924. State officials tasked with enforcing fisheries regulations even went beyond established codes to crack down on native fishers, as if they had a personal vendetta against them. These efforts further hampered indigenous fishing. From 1958 to 1967, the state's tribes only landed 6.5% of the salmon caught. Not only did these actions undercut the notions of a common space of open and equal access, but they also struck at the rights natives had reserved for themselves in treaties such as the ones signed at Nia Bay. The overfishing that unfolded in this marine settler commons was not simply an example of the tragedy of the commons as outlined by ecologist Garrett Hardin in his classic essay. Instead, it was a tragedy of open access, in which underlying clashes of values fueled by racism cut out one set of users, indigenous fishers, from the fishery. The narrative of this marine settler commons does not end with the overwhelming victory of the settler colonial United States, however. Beginning in the 1930s, the people of the Cape 
through a newly formed tribal council, fought back with various legal and political strategies to reclaim their share of the marine settler commons, a space that had once been their property. Joining with other tribal nations in Washington state, they successfully litigated U.S. v. Washington, a case in 1974, which became known as the Bolt Decision, named so because of the favorable opinion made by District Court Judge George Bolt. In this landmark treaty rights case, Judge Bolt determined that the treaty language to fish in common with meant something more like Colchute's original fishing together sentiment. Through the treaties, tribal nations in Washington had reserved half of the fish for themselves. Although this was a major victory, it remains incomplete. The most lucrative halibut fisheries, Swift, Sure, and Forty Mile Banks, still sit in Canadian waters that the United States has not even bothered to secure since the two nations declared exclusive fishery zones in 1977. Extending 200 miles out to sea, these zones demarcate U.S. and Canadian maritime sovereignty far offshore. Subjects from one country cannot fish in the waters of the other unless specific accommodations are negotiated. These macaw banks ended up under Canadian jurisdiction because they sit closer to Vancouver Island than Washington State's coastline. In 1978, the U.S. State Department secured the rights of recreational fishers in Canadian, formerly macaw, waters, while ignoring the tribal nation's request to secure the treaty rights of the people of the Cape to their ancestral fisheries. This is just one example of the ways that the invasive nature of settler colonialism, even that over indigenous, indigenous marine spaces, is, as Patrick Wolf notes, a structure not an event that Native people such as the people of the Cape continue to experience to this day. Macaws continue to push back against the marine settler commons that Governor Stevens established in 1855. We can see this in their recent efforts to exercise the most critical right, whaling, that they reserve for themselves in the Treaty of Nia Bay. After the 1999 whale hunt, which was the first in over 70 years, Animal rights activists opposed to, uh, to macaw whaling secured a court injunction preventing the people of the Cape from hunting more whales. In Anderson v. Evans in 2004, the Ninth Circuit Court decided that the treaty phrase, to fish in common with, limited the current rights of macaws to hunt whales because the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972 gave U.S. citizens no share of whales. Drawing from the sharing logic outlined by Bolt, the court decided that 50% of zero, i.e. no share, equaled zero. This decision violates what most courts define as the three principal canons for understanding treaty rights. They should be liberally construed in favor of tribal nations. They should be interpreted as native negotiators would have understood them at the time and they should be interpreted so as to promote the central purpose of the treaty from an indigenous perspective. Calchutes fishing together, whether it was for salmon, halibut, or whales, was an extension of rights to non-natives, not the other way around, as the Evans decision incorrectly seemed to assume. As this example of the creation of the marine settler commons illustrates, settler colonialism is about more than just the acquisition and control of native lands. The usual narrative of settler colonialism remains rooted in, ter in terrestrial spaces because settlers settle. Yet the process of settling also unfolded at sea. What this case study reveals is that settler colonialism is more accurately framed as the acquisition and control of all native property, even that beyond terrestrial domains. Furthermore, if settler colonialism is a structure, as Patrick Wolf has argued, then, na then nation states such as the United States, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, among others, have sought structural changes like the reconfiguration of property regimes that eliminate indigenous peoples in perpetuity and continually.
And as this example in Macaw Waters reveals, nation states transformed property regimes in more ways than just by imposing private property. They also used the commons to eliminate native property under the auspices of open and equal access for all, including settlers and indigenous peoples. Yet after Governor Stevens had replaced native control over property and spaces, such as Macaw Marine Space off Cape Flattery with a settler commons, non-natives could more completely eliminate indigenous fishers through state regulations and even international agreements. While this example of settler commons highlights the historical complexity of settler colonialism, it also illustrates indigenous agency. In 1855, Colchute and other Macaw leaders sought to mitigate the expansion of the United States by protecting what was most important to their people, the sea. The transformation of Colchute's fishing together with the treaties to fish in common with uncovers the important roles that language, differences in worldviews, and treaty-making processes served in undercutting indigenous sovereignty. As the legislative power of settlers and officials in Washington state made it increasingly difficult for the people of the Cape to exercise their treaty rights, they fought back in the courts to restore some of what their ancestors had guaranteed through the Treaty of Nia Bay. These struggles continue, thereby demonstrating that settler colonialism is not simply confined to the past and to terrestrial spaces, but is a very real insidious con uh, structure that shapes the lives of today's indigenous peoples, even at sea. I look forward to our subsequent discussion later this week, and thank you for listening.